Hey, what is going on? It is Crypto Bobby. Hope you are having a great day, great night, wherever you're watching or listening in from. Today, I have a really special interview for you. It is with Nikhil and Atit from CoVenture Crypto. I got a chance to meet these two guys through City Block Capital. Both Nikhil and Atit are investment partners uh, alongside myself in the NYCQ fund that they're doing. So I got a chance to sit down in their office a few weeks ago and was pretty much blown away by both the VC style and trading background that uh, both Nikhil and Atit have, as well as the sophistication of strategies that they have at CoVenture Crypto. So the second I talked to them in person, I knew they had to come on the channel, was really excited when they agreed to do that and we got that lined up. So I think you are really, really going to enjoy this conversation. A lot of good stuff, even towards the end of it. So make sure you stay tuned all the way through. Hit that thumbs up button, the like button, if you enjoyed this video. But without further ado, let's take it away. Quick background. I was a venture capitalist at SoftBank for a number of years. I was an entrepreneur before that. Uh, I've always kind of operated in emerging asset classes. So I was a moonshot investor. Uh, Masayoshi Sun at SoftBank is like this crazy larger than life figure today and I was fortunate to um, be a small part of, uh, of the venture capital business that SoftBank had and built a brand around trying to find the most deep tech craziest, you know, going to solve a billion people's problems, going to make a billion in EBITDA kind of um, hopes and dreams ideas. So that was what I built my career on originally. And it was in 2011 that I discovered crypto. Uh, and it was a founder who ended up becoming, you know, the founder of Ripple and uh, taught me about what a distributed ledger was. And it was pretty neat. Fast forward many years later, uh, left the traditional venture capital and we created a diversified asset management firm in crypto, mostly because we saw uh, a huge opportunity that um, you know, being a very, very conservative kind of approach to target institutions wasn't really being done yet. So that was the the, the kernel of uh, of where it began. Awesome, awesome. What's what's your background? <laughs> uh, I started out at Goldman Sachs. I was really lucky to work there from 2006 to 12. Um, ran their credit index desk, trading high yield, investment grade, financial uh, bonds against their single names, doing arbitrage against each other and other asset classes, doing relative value, namely against uh, equities. Um, and then uh, from there, went to Bluecrest, uh, ran a small macro portfolio um, covering all asset classes globally. Um, and then went to Barclays, built out a block trading desk for their credit index product and their macro desk for credit. Um, and then was fortunate enough to join up with Nikhil and work with him here at CoVenture. Awesome. And I think the the combination too, just from your backgrounds, uh, Nikhil, you're kind of in the the venture capital space and a TU on you know, the trading side at Goldman and a number of other places. How does that like play together with co-venture crypto? Like how do your backgrounds maybe complement each other, fill in any specific gaps? I think, you know, it's kind of a, an interesting combination there. Atit's the smart one and I'm the loud one. So it's like a really good combo. They hear about and I never it. correct him. I never correct him when he <laughs> says that, even if it's false. Uh, basically, we, we've got a, a pretty finance heavy team overall and we have a pretty software engineering team overall because that's the dna of of coventure to give you a sense of it started out a lot of software engineering really really focused on fintech many of us as individuals were early angel investors or um, venture investors into the fintech industry mm -hmm. um, some of those companies are now public they're well known established businesses and <clears throat> very quickly we realized okay we've got the ear of a very large number of sophisticated, ultra high net worth finance executives who end up becoming investors in the various co-venture uh, funds. And as a result of that, we you know, had a good ear to the ground in terms of tech, had a good ear to the ground in terms of what's interesting from the finance world. Crypto is an obvious natural extension when you have that, that deep DNA. And we of course had that in our personal backgrounds. So the way I kind of think about building out the team is we usually come up with our own ideas. We're all entrepreneurs at the core. We've all, you know, founded companies or, you know, founded and exited companies and, you know, have had a couple of uh, shots on goal at the very least. And, and then the, the rest of us that haven't been entrepreneurs are, are deep finance kind of backgrounds. 15 years at Goldman, you know, several years at, uh, at top hedge funds like a T has been and, <clears throat> um, or venture capital experience. 
So the way I think about it is you have to have a big fundraising element. You have to have sophistication in finance so you can come up with the right strategies and you have to understand the software side because that's the, you know, the core of what crypto is. Uh, that's kind of how I think about it. But going forward, you know, we're, we're now a pretty diversified business, right? Just within crypto, we've got an index strategy, a, um, you know, a, a asset management business, um, with lots of, with a quant strategy, we've got a venture strategy, we've got, you know, acquiring large assets within the sector. So almost like an M and a sort of mm -hmm. approach. Um, so it's a little bit different than just like a one, a one trick pony, but I think you have to be in crypto, right? If anybody that tells you they know crypto is going to be in three years in terms of price or in terms of what the coolest technology is like, they're always <laughs> lying, right? They can't possibly know what's going on. And so what we keep seeing is that there's new opportunities to, you know, exploit inefficiencies in the market or identify extraordinary talent like T and like build a whole strategy around them. And that helps, you know, create new complementaries that we didn't even see before. I'll give you like a real world example. Um, we put out a, a quant role like for our, for our quant strategy, you know, we're hiring a bunch of quants. And I think within six days we got over 605 qualified <laughs> applications. That must have been a fun time reviewing this. Yeah, it's, it's still an ongoing process, by the way. And, and just to be clear, we said, okay, and by the way, you can still go on LinkedIn and find, like, by the way, if you're listening and you're an amazing quant with, like, machine learning background, you know, and, and you know, definitely apply. Um, but we had to take it down the first time because we got too many applications. We said, okay, this is, we need to increase the, the bar. But it's extraordinary the kind of talent and caliber of folks that are coming into the sector. Uh, I think we said, you know, you must be two years experience at a hedge fund, you know, masters in um, computer science and financial analysis or machine learning and, you know, understand crypto. And it's unbelievable the quality of caliber. People that are willing to come with, you know, a massive reduction, reduction in their salary for the opportunity to, you know, be on a platform and be in an industry that is, you know, obviously exploding crazy i think that's uh yeah i mean the, the level of talent too you continue to see it on like a daily basis basically with whether it's traditional finance or people in tech that are just joining either startups or some of that i guess you could say more established crypto companies as well but yeah the the, the talent migration is it's one of the more interesting things i think i've seen just yep. as far as Bobby, watching that if, if you or i tried to get into crypto now we wouldn't be able to all right the bar was so low when we got <laughs> in you know, they let in schmoes like us but now it's completely different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was like you. Okay, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, so so one thing um, I, I think that I just from from your perspective uh, that I've heard you talk a little bit about, Nikhil, has just been kind of consistent learning and, and adding value just through kind of building your own skill set um, and knowledge base. And a lot of people always ask on the YouTube channel or the podcast, like, what what's the best way to to, to learn this industry. So, you know, knowing what you know now about, uh, you know, building a knowledge base and learning, and then uh, just the crypto industry in general, having been in it for a number of years now, how would you recommend somebody you know, from just like ground zero with, with no knowledge base at all in crypto? How would you recommend somebody to, to start learning this, this industry in a pretty comprehensive manner? Are there any like specific steps or any recommendations that you would, you would have on that? Sure. So, if you're a beginner, the best thing you can possibly do is recognize that the vast majority of the world is still beginners and that intro content is really valuable still. And there, you can go Google, you can Google, like, what is a blockchain? What is crypto? Why is blockchain important? Why is crypto important? And you'll find 100 different articles on it, right? But the reality is most people are still not finding those. And if you have your authorship associated with that, anyone that says, where can I learn? You'll have your crypto 101 document. So we have most of the folks that work with us that are, you know, um, just joining the industry for the first time or interns or whatever it is, create a crypto 101. And it's their version of what are the best links? What are all the things you wish you knew when you first started? And then you'll have this document so you give it to everybody that, you know, wants to learn. Because I assure you, once you're in crypto, you must have a, well, why is this important intro kind of conversation at least a few times a week? And all of a sudden that document gets permeated. It goes online. People start reaching out to you. And very quickly, you become maybe not of the whole industry, not of the established industry, but for the newcomers, you can become a, a helpful resource to them. So that's like the first thing is know who's putting out the crypto 101s 
once you kind of get that, I get almost almost all my information from from Twitter and Telegram. That's a value, yeah. right? At least that's scalable. Uh, I think everyone will probably pretty much agree with that. The only other information that's super valuable is our internal data that we as a company have proprietary created and you know we trade on and that kind of stuff. And that's like at a, obviously I would hope a much more advanced level than say crypto 101 or even just talking about you know new data sources in mm -hmm. Telegram and things like that. Um, outside of that, you get a ton of information from talking with folks. So uh, right now, the best resources I have are to come up with like, is this a challenge kind of question? Mm -hmm. So for example, I don't know, something that he has bantied about a lot is, is ICO treasury management. And it's this idea of like, hey, these people raise a bunch of money. Uh, do you want to, that seems like that's a problem as much as it is a solution. You know, how do we solve for that? Um, and so there's a bunch of efforts going on around you know, uh, what they can do about it. But the only real way to answer, you know, is to talk to, to the founders, talk to the head of finance, or CEO of the founders of any of these ICOs, or even the head of community who are much easier to reach out to, and talk to them like, hey, you've got 20 million set in the bank, how are you managing that cash flow or whatever? And this is just one little problem. And all of a sudden, you become the most knowledgeable person after 10 really quick conversations. Um, and that's worth the blog post, or that's worth sharing with folks that might be able to come up with a solution and you position yourself as, as like the toll booth on the information highway of that particular vertical, right? And you just, as long as you have a leg to stand on, you can then start building your database of everything crypto from there. But to try to boil the ocean is a surefire way of not getting very far quickly. Yeah, I think that's something it's, it seems like, at least to me, I mean, there's so much information out there. And then there's also so many different topics within the crypto world now that uh, I think a lot of people seem to struggle just from like the deluge of information. It's just like kind of just they they look at 75 different medium posts or you know, Twitters or telegrams and they just get overwhelmed and then they give up. Um, so I think that's yeah, that, those are all those are all really you know good, interesting points. I don't know if there's anything maybe um, from your perspective, Ati, that that you use like to, to filter through some of the information or any anything that you look at that maybe helps you be be a little bit more efficient when it comes to to the amount of, of stuff out there. Yeah, you know, the finance background helped me out a lot so I could look at specific case studies with countries and why their citizens would need to use crypto. And then that gets you down a rabbit hole of going through, you know, different information sources. For me, it was kind of a brute force. Uh, you know, let's listen to everyone uh, on a particular podcast on that topic. Let's listen to all 86 episodes on this thing and come up with notes and then talk to guys like Nikhil, talk to guys like Savneet and, and have conversations around where that should lead and, and could lead. Um, for me, it was it was much more of a brute force exercise. And I think that's in part why Nikhil was uh, good enough for our, for our interns, for our younger guys on the team to put together that 101 kind of document to give them some more formal training so that when they come in, they're just not inundated with a ton of information. It's like, look, spend a week looking through these specific documents when it comes to mining, when it comes to, you know, information and when it comes to acquisition of content and you'll be all right. Totally. Um, and, and you would obviously spent kind of a number of years in the traditional finance world uh, trading. Looking at obviously the, the crypto world right now is extremely still new and, and nascent, especially in the like infrastructure side of the house. When you look at the, the type of trading you were doing in the traditional finance world versus uh, kind of how you're approaching things now, like what's what are the major differences that, that, that you see or that you have to deal with on a, on a daily or just continual basis when it comes down to that? I think there's a lot more troubleshooting now. So, I mean, we built our own in-house data um, aggregator just so that we are connected to different exchanges so that we always have a source of primary data because uh, the information that they put out is not necessarily regulated, uh, depending on which jurisdiction they're in. As a result, uh, it requires you to build everything from scratch. So if I want to trade the S&P 500, I'll open up an interactive broker's account. I'll throw some money in there and I'll just start trading away as long as I meet the margin requirements. With this, it's much more, okay, well, I need a trading account. Okay, I need to think about redundancy. How many trading accounts should I have? Okay, I have to have geographical redundancy. Okay, I have to have, uh, you know, redundancy in the, um, you know, the type of operator in terms of the products they offer. What else do I need? I need data. Okay, well, now I need to build out my own in-house data. Okay, now I have to have redundancy for that data. Now I have to have re geographical redundancy for that redundancy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> then it goes into everything else. Like, well, what about security? Oh, well, you know, I have, have two-factor authentication when it comes to my, you know, whatever, E-Trade account. 
Uh, but with this, it's much more involved. Okay, how do I store it? What's the most effective way to store it? How do I think about it from a client's perspective when it comes to storage? How do I, you know, what's the, what are the three most secure ways to store it? You know, um, so every little piece of the backend infrastructure that I would think about in traditional finance or rather take for granted, I actually have to think about now. So it's, it's really going back to the pre Lehman days of trading in terms of thinking about your data, your trades, who your trades face. Uh, you know, your security, your counterparty risk, et cetera. So that, that's the main difference, I'd say. Sure. Do you feel like there will be a point in time where there might be kind of a, the, the crypto world might be able to catch up to some of maybe the level of sophistication or security that, you know, you, you were traditionally used to in, uh, you know, in previous roles? Absolutely. I mean, you could see it right now, like Goldman Sachs is already in, involved. JP Morgan's involved. Morgan Stanley has a working group to get involved. Uh, you know, every big bank is seeing how they can best position themselves to take advantage of trading, uh, whether it's the volatility in the asset space or giving their clients access to it. Um, so I, I think that's that's might be two to three years down the road before they kind of instead of dipping their toe in the form of a working group, they actually have a product or a vehicle to get involved. Um, but you can see the writing on the wall from that perspective. And that just means it's only a matter of time before we see kind of parity in terms of accessibility for all types of clients. Totally. Is there anything maybe on, on your end, uh, Nikhil, that I, I know it's maybe a little bit kind of different from the from the perspective of, of your background, but but would be interested in hearing maybe the, some, some differences that you've noticed as well? Yeah, I'm not the typical traditional finance background guy. Uh, you know, I was an engineer. I was in the military intelligence in my first career. Um, we started a small, you know, trading shop pretty pretty early, but it was you know just a you know friends um, kind of structure, not a traditional asset management business. And then I was in the tech world um, as an entrepreneur, and now and then as an investor. And and VCs are not traditional finance. Right? Most VCs nowadays are product people or engineers and by background and trade. So uh, the irony is that you're seeing a lot of these asset managers out there that are primarily just venture funds. Right? They're trying to meet teams. They're trying to meet guys that are got good ideas. And I think you and I have chatted about there's only three kinds of investors on the venture side. Right? The, the kind that invest in markets, the kind that invest in, in teams, um, and the kind that invest in uh, in uh, in business models. And at the end of the day, if we're not in reinventing new business models, in most cases, with the exception of ICOs, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which isn't a revenue model, it's just fundraising uh, for the most of them, then, and there's not really a market yet for most of it. So you're really investing in teams. All these venture funds are investing in teams primarily. I just think it's really funny that there's so much debate about the structure and economic structures and incentivizations of a lot of protocols out there. Mm -hmm. but the reality is that uh, it doesn't matter if they raise $500,000 or $500 million, you're primarily investing in the team at this point in time. It's gonna take four or five years for it to play out to see if it's, if it's gonna be real. And that's a venture game. That's not a traditional finance you know, approach. Mm -hmm. I do think that there's a play for traditional finance. I mean, we're in this because I think there's a play for traditional finance, whether that's exchanges or that's infrastructure or that is um, you know, quantitative models for, for trading. I think that's really where, where our background is unique. There is one other, there's one other angle and that's kind of the, the global nature of cryptocurrency. And it's pretty easy to say, you know, 2011, 2012, going back, like it was, it was very concentrated in a handful of geographies, but it wasn't Silicon Valley at all. Right. It was, it was Japan. It was, you know, a few buddies that you might have known that are kind of around the world. Uh, and now 44% of transaction volume is still in JPY uh, to date. Um, you know, China announced what was it last week that they're finally killing off by September all of the, you know, remaining miners <laughs> that are illegally operating, although they're, you know, heavily concentrated in, in a few regions um, not too far away. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but what I love about the cryptocurrency universe is that you can create a very, very large business that's quite diversified. I mean, even Telegram today, its team is, I don't know if you know this, but the team is like traveling all around the summer in amazing places and living in a pretty distributed kind of environment. That's while they're building their protocol. I've, I've never seen that happen before in any startup, especially one that it has as good of a team 
yeah. and has raised as much capital as they have, usually they become, you know, even more uh, concentrated. concentrated, right? Um, so it's kind of the some peculiarities and uniqueness of crypto that is you don't see in either finance or, or tech typically. For sure. Um, and one thing that you had mentioned in, in your, you know, your personal background, but also just the way co-venture is structured, where I think heavy focus you'd mentioned on, on engineers. Um, mm -hmm. And when you, whether it's, I don't know if it's, you know, short term or if it's kind of medium to longer term for type like venture crypto investing, um, how heavy like diligence are you able to conduct from like an engineering perspective? Because obviously, like you said, you know, when you are uh, either investing or, or, you know, kind of participating with these, you know, assets in some way or another, um, you are in a lot of cases investing in the team and, and a kind of a longer term, maybe vision, but at the same point in time, you know, there is an opportunity and in, in many respects, at least to evaluate a GitHub, see how legit the team is, whatever it might be. Um, what type of like diligence are, are you able to, to maybe conduct? And, um, is that something that you like take into, to account when you are, you know, making these plays on, uh, you know, on, on investments? So we do, but we discount it heavily because the reality is that most of the companies that you're investing into are, uh, you know, the vast majority of their life is still yet to be written, mm -hmm. right? So you really want to underwrite what's happening in the future as opposed to underwriting what's happened in the past, especially many things have only been around for less than a year. And hopefully they're going to be around for many years. So towards doing that, yeah, you want to, you want to evaluate, um, you know, what's the caliber of, of their engineering team? You know, do we want to bring in a security consultant? Do you want to bring in a, you know, uh, smart contract, uh, security audit kind of analysis? Do you want to do a regulatory analysis? Sure, you want to do those things. But, you know, I would take into account all those sorts of things and put that as 25% of the investment decision and 75% is all types of other stuff. And keep in mind, that's just on the venture-like sure. sort of thing, right? Some of the examples of stuff that's exciting me uh, from a venture side is, you know, fully regulated uh, exchanges, whether they are security tokens or they are uh, or traditional cryptocurrencies mm -hmm. or, or de decentralized exchanges, DEXs. Right? In, in all three of these examples, I think that outside of the U.S., countries are now anointing winners based on giving them regulatory permits. From a venture perspective, that's awesome. That just narrowed the field of like the 30 exchanges that are probably launching in Libya to like four, right? <laughs> uh, which makes it much easier from an investor's perspective. Now that just happens to be what's happening right now for this quarter. I don't know what's going to happen by Q4. <laughs> Maybe it's a completely different world. And, you know, there's 10 DEXs in every country and they're all equal market share. Probably not, but maybe. <laughs> Double. Double. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so, you know, going to the exchange point, you had talked a little bit about kind of exchanges. And I think you've talked about this before, uh, just basically liquidity being king. And I think both of you probably have some really interesting insights on this. So I'd love to hear just your thoughts right now um, about some of the challenges maybe presented by the potential lack of liquidity for a lot of these assets. Um, and then you know, how you're able to, to potentially overcome some of the, you know, the challenges that you face with, with liquidity. So I'll take a first stab, but I think Atit will have a much smarter answer. So I'll <laughs> defer to whatever, whatever he says. Uh, Liquidity crunch has been the, you know, the most telltale sign that you're in cryptos. <laughs> uh, when, when we think about liquidity, we think about geographical fragmentation. Absolutely. We think about high quality liquidity and low quality liquidity, meaning counterparties that we know are going to be there. They're going to be well funded. We know are, have certain security protocols in there. And as a result of those certain security protocols, different parts of their liquidity is available at different speeds. Mm -hmm. Right? They might have hot wallets, but the reality is they might only have 10, 15% of their access uh, on hot wallets. They, uh, the rest might be in some kind of cold storage with you know, some sort of delay on it. When we think about our counterparty risk, we have to think, okay, well, you know, what, what's our liquidity exposure? Right? And we have got different protocols in place for different, our different products, um, some of which have deep cold storage, some of which are cold storage, some of which are hot you know, wallets effectively. All of which we would say is, you know, in the most conservative kind of category from an overall uh, liquidity exposure, um, you know, risk perspective. Um, from, you know, a business model perspective, liquidity is, uh, you can think of, of liquidity as a lens uh, into business models, right? Some people are willing to pay a lot of money for a high degree of liquidity. 
Um, if you had a fund that had $100 million in it, you could probably get out of your position over a period of time. Uh, but if you had a fund that was a billion dollars, <laughs> it's going to be really, really, really hard to get out. So as a result, you might want to have different classes of liquidity, right? Some folks that are able to pay more for a higher degree of liquidity, some folks that are paying less, but they've got a longer lockup. And that you know, allows you to play with fund sizes and liquidity um, in, from a revenue perspective, which is, which is pretty interesting. Um, Atit, what are your what are your thoughts? Atit thinks about it a lot from the the, the quantitative perspective, sure. um, not just from a you know a fund management perspective. Yeah, so I mean, there's there's two angles. The first angle is in the quant fund, and how I think about liquidity is you know what's the real size of a particular market. So if you think cryptocurrencies are a three hundred billion plus market, the actual effective size of the market, if you exclude stuff that's been locked up in foundations, for example, or coins that have been lost, it's actually around 100 billion. So you think about liquidity in terms of actual size of addressable market, uh, then you can look at daily turnover, uh, geographical split of that daily turnover, uh, your counterparty risk when it comes to affecting trades of a particular size. Um, and then we also think about, uh, you know, what are you doing? In fact, if you run a quantitative model on a particular currency, well, if it's not in the top five or 10 cryptos, I'd argue that you're not trading at all because you're not in a liquid position. You're doing something altogether different. Um, so if we think about how we trade in, in the active fund, that's predominantly, I'd say 90% plus is in the top 10 currencies mm -hmm. because of that liquidity issue. Um, when it comes to sort of like the venture area, when I see Nikhil, Savneet, Ali, the rest of the guys look at deals. When I look at deals with them, um, we think of liquidity in terms of how we structure arrangements and, and how we invest in, in different companies. And that liquidity will determine sort of the structure of the deal. It, it might warrant um, you know, one type of investment over another. Uh, and again, that has a lot to do with liquidity and, and geographical diversification. Uh, to Nikhil's point, what kind of security mechanisms they have in place, all that ties into the real liquidity as opposed to the optical liquidity. Sure. Uh, and it's no different than the quant fund from that perspective. Um, and that assessment dictates how we invest and the structure that that investment takes. Gotcha. And going from the one of the last points you had there of like real versus optical, um, I think one thing that a lot of people have questions or comments on as far as what's real versus maybe what isn't. Um, would love to get any thoughts on just overall exchange volume as well. And there's a lot of things that have been happening recently yeah. with oh, yeah. <laughs> a number of exchanges that have, have come out and we don't have to go into specific exchanges, but yeah, would love to get your thoughts because I've been in conversations with people where it's like, hey, what, what percentage of this volume is actually real? Is it fake? Is it watch so trading? Yeah, so so I'll take you back to the first com I think the first um non getting to know you conversation I had with Nikhil was uh me saying exactly that uh al something along those lines where I'm like, "Well, you know we have to build our own data because you can't even tell what the actual metrics that you'd be trading against are because <laughs> exchanges are incentivized to, you know, it's a perverse incentive to misinform the public about how much volume takes place so that they can attract more coins and charge them for listing." Uh, and he goes, yeah, I know. So what are you going to do about it? And I'm like, okay, so here's what I propose we do about it. And it's, it, it, was, it's, uh, it was the first time I talked to someone uh, a peer in terms of analytical framework for analyzing exactly that, um, that amongst many other issues. And what we decided to do as a team is uh, we have an engineer that works with us that used to work at Twitter. He's responsible for sourcing data. And we've built out uh, web sockets, so direct links with the top 42 exchanges globally. And, and I think within the next two weeks, we'll have another 40 exchanges. We monitor actively who are the next exchanges coming up uh, in terms of um, offering liquidity because that turnover and the, like call it the top 10 or top 20 exchanges is quite big. Um, so we source the data ourselves to make sure that we can capture all the information real time. We can store it ourselves. We don't have to rely on someone six months later and say, hey, uh, by the way, tell us how much Bitcoin you traded on April 4th. Uh, that's not the issue. We'll have it mm -hmm. firsthand. Um, and then we can actually run scripts against data that they claim to have uh, uh, created. Uh, so we can run scripts against our original primary source ingested data versus what they claim to have uh, done on their exchange. And if there's a discrepancy, then we know, okay, there's something to investigate from, again, a counterparty credit risk perspective or from a liquidity risk perspective. So uh, liquidity is kind of the kingmaker in our 
our field and how we examine it. It's not just, oh, well, you know, he says he trades X. And if she says she trades that much, <laughs> it's, uh, well, we'd rather just rely on the numbers. It's a lot easier. Uh, it's a lot cleaner. And then it allows us to, to do many more things, either on investment or on the quant fund in terms of uh, trading. For sure. Um, so I, I have a, uh, here, here are my thoughts. I think what you're getting at is trans is exchange transaction volume as mining is a wildly innovative, and this is the nicest way I can possibly say it, <laughs> uh, approach to economic incentivization, but it's wash trading and it's pretty BS. So I think it'll go away. I think it's attracting a lot of fake volume. Um, I think it's also attracting a lot of attention, which is leading to real volume and more power to these emerging exchanges for being so creative. Um, but at the end of the day, I don't think, um, I think there's one, one stat I saw like a, I don't know, I forget which crypto it was. Was it 10 X or zero X with like $900 million dollars? Of I think it was. I think volume. it was 10x. I, I think it was 10x. I don't. That, rem I don't remember one, exactly. That went up like 100 percent in like 24, 48 hours or something ridiculous. And I was trying to find the news. No news. No nothing. Just you know, crypto being crypto. Exactly. So those are the kinds of things where it's an obvious red flag, not a yellow flag, but a red flag uh, that there's you know fake volume going on here. I think even Coin Market Cap disqualified it from their rankings like almost immediately because they were right on top of it. Um, so, so I think, I think, I think, you know, this kind of innovation is awesome. What is really clear is that it's not happening in America. It's definitely <laughs> happening. No, it's in definitely Korea. not. <laughs> uh, because obviously if you put fake volume out there, you get in trouble with regulators. Um, but in many of those jurisdictions where they're doing these sorts of things, they have maybe less of a worry or perhaps, um, don't care. I'm not really sure what the, what the rationale is. Uh, at that same time that this happened in China when the first exchanges came out too, mm -hmm. right? Um, in China and even in Japan originally, many of the exchanges had a free tier of transactions where you don't pay any transaction fee, assuming you hit a certain minimum volume. Well, guess what? Everybody would just artificially trade amongst themselves to hit that volume and they don't have to worry about transaction fees, right? And it was a great way to jumpstart uh, transaction volume on any given exchange. I think if every exchange did it, the ARB goes to zero and it doesn't really matter anymore. Every exchange won't do it, but enough will do it where it becomes um, irrational to have fake volume at, of that kind on your, on your exchange. Yeah, no, I think it's, uh, it's been pretty crazy to watch that happen. And like these exchanges just come out of absolutely nowhere to be ever top five in volume. It's, it's been, it's like, what what's f what's f coin what what is this exactly. where did this come from um, so here's 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 the interesting i think we're going to keep seeing this kind of innovation up until we have that real milestone increase uh in, in step function kind of growth of transaction volume on traditional exchanges i think i think the step function growth for new transaction volume on exchanges isn't going to be a result of huge institutions onboarding onto exchanges Huge institutions will onboard to these exchanges, but they won't necessarily bring a billion dollars of transaction volume individually or even as a group right away. Just like any others, they'll slow play it, they'll roll it. What we need is good product for them to actually invest into. So what I think is happening is Coinbase is expanding into security token offerings. They denied it for a long time. I think the approvals in the last week allows them to acquire a few security exchanges. I think you're going to start to see traditional equities get onboarded into one or two global exchanges, probably non-US uh, equities, probably non-US exchanges. But all of a sudden, there's going to be some, regula some regulatory authority that's approved this exchange and says, you know what? If you want to trade a cryptographically secure oil or a crypto token that represents Apple or whatever it is, we are going to provide that for you. And now all these folks can get access to it on, on a, a, to a traditional asset onto a non-traditional mechanism. Because many of those folks, they don't want to go to their Charles Schwab account like they do in America, right? They may not be a billionaire or worth 100 million plus who you know, have a whole team of people that are managing their money. They just want to go into a crypto exchange, use their crypto and buy Apple, right? And all of a sudden this product now is a regulated, approved, 
you know, uh, product on a crypto exchange, now you're going to have a billion dollars worth of transaction volume happening on that exchange. That's real and legitimate. I think it, just to add to Nikhil's point, the other thing is a lot of these institutions, when you talk to them, uh, you know, BlackRock manages $6.2 trillion worth of assets. Um, so a space that's like, uh, you know, optically 300 billion, but in reality, a hundred and some billion is not going to move the needle for them. You know, even if it doubles, it's not going to be anything on their radar in terms of how much they can invest in the asset class. So once it does cross certain milestones and that that milestone appears to be about the one trillion dollar mark, you know, once we build out the pipes to get people on boarded. Uh, but to Nikhil's point and, and, and the much more important point is once there's good product to invest in, that's when you're going to start to see transaction volume pick up. And these exchanges won't really need to worry about engineering uh, volume where you're like, look, the price range was, you know, 350 bucks today. There's no way volume tripled. You know, we don't need to even discuss this. And there's, there's simple ways to kind of strip out which exchanges are doing what, uh, and kind of have like, you know, what I would call actual real, whatever you want volume. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to add that in there. Bobby, what's the craziest, what's the craziest <laughs> idea in crypto that you've heard recently? It doesn't have to be real. It can be, you know, a, a, a rumor kind of thing. Um, what's what sort of like what comes to mind? I mean, I feel like the majority of, I don't know. I mean, there's a, there's a, you should see my, I'm, I'm sure obviously you have money to deploy. So I'm sure your, your emails are just full of, of junk. Um, but I get a absolute ton of, I probably get 15 to 20 emails a day from different token sale <laughs> projects about wanting to be on the YouTube channel or whatever and, and trying to tokenize. Uh, I mean, I've uh, there donuts on the blockchain. There's, <laughs> they, there's, I I've like seen, that. I think there's hair dryers on the blockchain. Um, okay. wow. like, <laughs> t t like the, the so level of, the level of tokenization, um, of, of anything. I, I just, there's, yeah. <laughs> here's, here's one. Uh, so I try to think about, so I, I love I love the crazy wild ideas. Yeah. Even in hair dryer in the blockchain, it's not All it's in. crazy, but it's All not in. big, right? It's not big enough. I like the big crazy ideas. Um, so I was brainstorming the other day with um, with a friend of mine who has got a large, you know, Asian uh, crypto company, and we were talking about, hey, remember those rumors from a few years ago? Did it was anything ever play out? And, and is that an opportunity to you know come up with an investment thesis? Right, and I, I think about everything with the lens of how do I express this investment opportunity in a bet? You know, what is cri cryptocurrency as a whole is a bet on what, right? And it's, you know, there's a lot of ways to take it. Well, if, if it's globalization and decentralization, if that's a bet on cryptocurrency, then effectively cryptocurrency is a bet on America, like not being the number one power, right? A crazy idea. Maybe if, if decentralization of everything, then then superpowers by definition economically would have less power. Now that, that's taking it to an extreme, you know, example, an egregious example with with the full intent that obviously, you know, hopefully it wouldn't be true or whatever it is, um, depending on where you're from. But like I began to think, like, what were the what were the crazy ideas that other cryptocurrencies can express and how can we make bets on them now? Like, for example, is Neo backed by the Chinese government? Maybe. I don't know. That's the, I don't, I, that's the rumor. It's the Chinese Ethereum. Everybody knows that. Right. right. That's, <laughs> that's the rumor. But what we do know is that several of their nodes are managed by NEO itself. Right. And so as a result of that, there's this risk that people say, oh, well, then, you know, someone could, you know, maybe the Chinese government, if they don't like it, they could do something about it, which is a big risk to any non, you know, Chinese investor in the protocol. Now, all of that might be BS. But let's just say, for argument's sake, that even if that is not true, the concern, the perceived concern is real, right? Because people may say, well, there's this risk. Fine. So now the perception is real. Therefore, if you could eliminate the perception, the value of NEO could conceivably go up. So what does that mean? If I set up a whole bunch of distributed NEO nodes, that risk goes away and all of a sudden the value should go up. That's a pretty interesting idea. So somebody, so in that conversation, we brainstormed that idea. That's one of the interesting, interesting examples of how, you know, bet the rumor, <laughs> sell, sell the fact in crypto and how you can kind of create 
value just by eliminating uncertainty and risk and, in, in the business. And that's, that's a really interesting point. Um, cause I, I think the, at least to me, some of the things that tend to move markets in the crypto world are so ridiculous. Um, and so like elementary, but at the same point in time, like you said, I, I don't know the, the, you know, the process of, of spinning up a Neo node, but maybe you could do that on, on an AWS server. And if somebody did that and a bunch of different ones in the U S and then there was a medium post of, Oh wow, Neo super decentralized now. And it's, the best thing in the world and then it goes up 50 percent in a day or something like that that is actually a realistic thing that can happen um but a teat from your end with like the quantitative side of the house like how does that how does how does some of like the the crazy external factors that i guess happen in crypto how do those affect the the quantitative side of of, of trading in this industry well, they affect everything. So, I mean, to the point where we're building out all our own systems, whether it's data acquisition, uh, to the point where we look at our models, and it's not like a traditional back test where we account for slippage, but we actually go through every single trade that the model would have taken, uh, and that's across models. Um, so, in every single trade, in every single model, we analyze what was the order book like, you know, what was the true slippage. I mean, it's all well and good to say like my back test made me 300% last year, but you know, if half the trades you could have bought 0.3 Bitcoin, well, you really didn't make that much money. Um, so it's about going through, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, that, that's, that's another point that makes it different from traditional finance is doing that kind of analysis. Um, and then also I think that's another reason why we stick to the most liquid coins in that fund. Uh, it's about me going through doing all the analysis and then I can have like a really v easy conversation with Nikhil and I'm like, Hey, here are the, here are the top, uh, 20 cryptos. Here are the 16 I want to invest in. And he's like, uh, okay, well, you know. This one, uh, the white paper says something different in Japanese than English, so maybe we stay away from that one. And that's a really easy uh, one to withdraw. So on the fundamental side, it's about <laughs> having yeah. having a good <laughs> <laughs> no comment, but okay. <laughs> it's, or it's a, letter uh, was a movie a, book. Uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> it's about having it's about having responsible people that someone from my background can then go ahead and say, well, great. And now I don't have to worry about you know fraudulent items in my fund uh and then from my perspective it's it's building out all the necessary infrastructure that so that Nikhil can come in and when, when whenever one of us has a trade idea we can just instantly code it up and, and get it going um but yeah no that that's a that's an especially big challenge but again that's why we concentrate in the most liquid uh currencies for this particular fund and it's you know i'd say 90 percent of them are done in the top top 10 currencies no question so no big moves in dentacoin <laughs> uh no uh no, nothing at all i mean the hair dryer coin uh we were thinking about it but uh no it didn't quite make the cut the yeah. i don't have any hair i can't even do diligence it so <laughs> actually one of the one of the things that is is actually fun to do is to to actually look like closely at a smart contract i think most most folks in crypto have never seen what a smart contract even looks like right True. they don't even know like what 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 is a smart contract not theoretically but you know, when you actually look at, at what it is, how many lines of code is it? How many folks were involved in creating it? How did you test it? How do the security protocols associated with it? What are the libraries you're getting it from? Where, you know, what does it actually look like? You know, is it vetted with a lawyer, right? Because many of these smart contracts are frankly just contracts, right? And uh, uh, so you see the initially, um, I'm, I'm actually really, really bullish on smart contract security auditing and I think that there's not just going to be a process for it, but I think there's going to be, those are going to be software companies. Mm -hmm. There'll be simulations, there'll be approaches, and the state of the art will go from taking a fully finished smart contract on an established blockchain with a good amount of, with, of throughput already on it to, I've got this idea of building this blockchain. It can go all these different ways. Here are all, here's the menu items, and here's an environment where you know, we can simulate it and test based upon you know, the application you have, whether it's healthcare or otherwise, you know, the kind of features you should have in that blockchain for the desirable amount of security. Not everything needs to be ironclad, state resistant, um, you know, state censorship resistant level security, right? There's many, you know, and EOS is a really good example, you know, where you don't need that level because you want to have it actually applicable to industries that don't need, you know, that level of decentralization. So, um, you know, I think it's, I think it's, I think that whole world is getting more and more and more complex. That's why we've seen an explosion of blockchains. You remember like last year, there was like an explosion of blockchains, all of which pretty much the exact same thing. Yep. 
And now they're actually applied to different sectors with competing incentives where, you know, the Ethereum blockchain could never be used for, you know, um, what Bitcoin's promise is right now. Right. Um, but and, and, you know, you go down all the different applications and it gets you know, even more minute in terms of what they need, what they do and how they compete with each other. But they're not all universal replacements. Yeah, no, that's. You're going to say something to you? Well, yeah, no, this is probably uh, my favorite part. Uh, well, not my favorite, but one of my favorite parts is so I don't have to do the brute first brute force learning. I can just say, hey, Nikhil, you know, or hey, Savneet, <laughs> or hey, Ali, like here, what are the top uh, three things I need to read about X, Y, Z in, in the crypto space? And I just off I go and it saves me like, you know, months of, of wasted time if I can just go to a resource and just get it done. You know, now I, I've been I've been speaking of, of learning. I'm a student of productivity and of like you know, of, of, of farming out as much learning as possible um, so that I can leverage myself and, and time. And are you guys familiar with how Vitalik used to do a bunch of his, you know, learning early on? You go to some of these conferences and put out a, um, basically like a, a tip, like a, a tipping point on an Ethereum wallet and say, if this gets to 10 Ethereum or whatever it is, like I'll, I'll share all my notes with everybody, not even just the people that invested, but he'll make it public. Right, which is great. And all of a sudden it's like crowdsourcing the amount of his time, investing in his time, so that he's gonna take these notes and share them with the world. I'm like that's a really, really interesting idea. First of all, he's decentralizing learning, <laughs> which is really, really on brand, <laughs> <laughs> to say the least. Uh, so powered uh, from the marketing side. But uh, number two is who's got the time to, to learn everything on their own? He's doing a favor for them. So now when I can't go to every conference, you can't go to every conference. Conferences aren't even the best place to learn. I don't, I don't want to go to every conference. No, it would be killer. It would be oh. terrible. So instead, now at like most of the conferences, I got like a plant that like takes notes and we share them in a group. And that's really helpful. My whole, my whole thesis is Asia is critical to the world of cryptocurrencies. You need to have knowledge there. You need to have people there. You need to have exposure mm -hmm. and whether that's singapore or or hong kong mainland china or japan like we we are in bed with sbi holdings right they're our partner in many many ways and we leverage that relationship because we think they are you know probably the most important inst financial institution in cryptocurrency today um and i think there's other players that can be like that in the future and and maybe we'll work with them or someone else will work with them too there's many other ways to skin the cat uh but we have to learn from them and they have to learn from us. So I think it's impossible for any one individual to become a superstar expert in the whole world of cryptocurrency. Yeah. You have to learn to farm it out or leverage other, other people. Yeah, that's, that's a fantastic point. And I think, I mean, you want to build up a baseline of knowledge and as much of a foundation as possible, but it gets to a point where like the more people that you can leverage uh, and go to on, on different kind of aspects. And I think, I mean, that's been one of the more helpful things to me, I mean, even just like working in, in the industry now at AirSwap is I can, I can ask one of the, you know, one of the developers at one point in time, Hey, there's something happening. Can you check out the smart contract? Can you look at it? Like, what are your totally. thoughts? Is it, Wait, so who you know, do you learn from? Who, who, who do you learn the most from? Um, in, so, I mean, there's a lot of people, I mean, just like, even generally speaking, I mean, I'm at, at the office a lot, so we're pretty much all the Probably time, but AirSwap, in, right? in, in AirSwap, um, talk to our co-founder Ovet a lot. There's a couple engineers there. One of our engineers, Graham is great. And Sam Walker is another one that like, even when um, like one, one thing like the bank war kind of hack happened where I guess they it was, it was, it was kind of hopping out on Twitter. I was seeing what, what the deal is. And there was a bunch of people saying things and I just kind of uh, posted something or I uh, just shot an email to one of the guys or posted in Slack. It was like, Hey, can you check out? Like, is this, did they, was it a smart contract issue? Like what happened? Was it treasury management? Um, dove into the smart contract. I'm not intellectually capable of doing that whatsoever. And just kind of get, came back with a couple different points of like, Hey, here's what's happening. And just, I uh, just built up some competency on that. And then, uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's also, there's a few like telegram groups I'm in that everyone is just way, way smarter than I am. Um, and for the most part, I just sit there and read every single thing that they say and try to absorb as much knowledge as possible. And that, that type of thing has been super helpful for me too. Yep. Yep. That's incredible. I, I would say there's, there's a bunch of, you know, bloggers out there um, that, you know, a lot of folks know um, there's a number of private email newsletters 
that I think are super, super valuable. Yeah. Proof um, of work with Eric Meltzer is good too for, I know he's in China a lot or Asia. So that's exactly. like somewhat helpful for me to get a little bit of exposure to that space. Exactly. Um, and then, and then just going super deep on any, you know, if you're like, if you want to love stable coins, <laughs> there's a newsletter just for stable coins. Right. Um, and if there's not, uh, you should make one, right? <laughs> because there's a group of people that are willing to, to read it. <laughs> uh, it's definitely, that's definitely the case. Um, and I, I mean, I think for the most part, I could sit here and probably talk to both of you guys all day about this stuff, but, um, Looking at, I would say, like the future of, of co-venture crypto, I know you are kind of tackling maybe a number of different like subsectors of this. I would love to hear your thoughts on like where you'd like to take the future of, of co-venture crypto. And then um, I got introduced to you guys through uh, City Block Capital um, and some of the work that uh, you know, of all three of us are, are doing with City Block Capital. So I'd love to hear as well, like how City Block and specifically that the NYCQ uh, kind of VC venture fund that they have security token might come into the mix with that as well. Sure. So Coventure Crypto, we want to be the most well-respected, institutionally oriented asset management platform for crypto. Right? That means we're catering to a certain tier of audience. That means we have to be at the bleeding edge of security and custody, but at the most conservative edge in terms of asset management approaches. So as like an example to that, when we were first creating our index strategy, you know, I was ca literally calling up every trust company in America being like, hey, you doing anything in crypto? No, cool. Hey, you doing anything <laughs> in crypto? No, cool. And eventually, this, this is not a joke, that's literally what was happening. And this is going back, whatever, you know, uh, year and a half, two years ago, whatever it is. And we eventually became the first firm to have a product custody, an index um, strategy custodied by a qualified custodian, Kingdom Trust in that case. And they were mm -hmm. the first to market, right? But we were also the first to work with them. So you have to be like, like really, really, really cutting edge in terms of security. That's like a part of our strategy, but also take a very, very conservative approach. As like another example, um, you know, we have, I think I can share this, uh, we have a, uh, a mutual fund approved by regulators, not in the US. And, you know, I think we're uh, the first in the world or one of the first um, to have that. So again, trying to be at the forefront of asset management, but you have to be really, really, really conservative in terms mm -hmm. of what those products are, which, you know, we, we can't discuss here. Yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> and then, you know, as a part of being in the crypto industry, you see deals. You get 15 great ones a day in your inbox, at least. Uh, I'll pass them along to you. They're wonderful. They're, they're very <laughs> worthy of your, of your capital. And I'll tell you I, that much. I appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> and so you have to be like deploying capital on the venture side as well, because all these companies are pretty early. So with CityBlock, um, just like with SBI Holdings and another um, multi-billion dollar, uh, a very, very large platform that we've partnered with but can't announce yet, we have leveraged and decided to work with CityBlock uh, to help be their first venture fund uh, that is focused on crypto infrastructure. It's a tokenized um, platform called NYCQ um, and is focused entirely around crypto infrastructure. So a T and I are, are both helping, just to be clear, it's, it's CityBlock's um, fund called NYCQ. Um, we are helping them deploy the capital and we're really impressed with the team. Um, we've got certainly, I think some really good deals to help push that capital towards. Um, but the, the goal is really to gain exposure to cryptocurrency infrastructure, which I think is the most important subsector of crypto venture today. Sure. Um, things like exchanges, it's things like security, you know, uh, security auditing. It's the picks and shovels of the industry uh, that will be around no matter, uh, no matter when institutions come in, they are some of the customer sets. So the way I think about it is the customer set for every company in the portfolio would be at the intersection of crypto startups and institutions coming in. And anywhere where those things overlap are kind of the target um, the target businesses that that capital want to invest into. That's awesome. 
And I, I mean, I think it's going to be exciting for, for me, number one, to, to get a chance to, to work in any capacity with you guys. Cause I think just in the, I'm sure as anybody watching or listening to this right now, uh, you get a sense for, for the level of sophistication from an investment standpoint for your team. So it should be pretty fun to, to, to be able to, to have some interaction there. Um, but kind of as we're finishing up here, I'm not sure if there's anything maybe I, I might have not asked or that you'd like to to leave off with. Uh, Nikhil or Atit would love to, you know, love anything that, that you might have, that I might have missed out in, in the conversation that you'd like to finish off with. You know, I think uh, the only thing to, to add is uh, um, that the city block guys, um, I, think, I think I'm okay to share this, just took a pretty strategic investment from Morgan Creek, um, which is really sends a message to the industry that they're a you know a top tier you know caliber group of folks and we're excited to work with them um i know you're excited to work with them yep. and uh you know i think morgan creek is, is also excited to work with them too obviously <laughs> so that's that's pretty exciting um uh and other than that uh coventure crypto is constantly hiring so if you love to if you love to write about crypto um, if you've got a blog on crypto, if you're a quant and you're all stats and math and machine learning and, or like business development, we're, we're uh, full steam ahead on, on all these kinds of roles and probably more that, um, we're, we're, we'll find out soon enough. So definitely shoot us an email, um, crypto at coventure.vc, uh, anytime. Yeah, when you do say you came from my podcast, because then I'll get a nice referral bonus. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but what is That's that again? <laughs> uh, it is. Uh, it will be um, a an amazing phone case oh i thought i thought you said one bitcoin a pop i it's, that's, <laughs> that's strange every single hair dryer deal we get that says from crypto bobby it's going to be, it's all your fault. It's all, it's all, all winners, all winners, the only winners. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the other thing, I, the only other thing I'd add, like uh, Nikhil spot on with that is anyone who has like thought, thoughts on, you know, regulation, evolution of the field that can talk to it on a, on a sophisticated level. We're always happy to have those conversations. Um, that, and that's how we got involved with City Block to begin with is uh, a group of thoughtful people who wanted to talk about um, everything from regulation to taxation to all the different evolutionary paths this space could take. So uh, we're always open-minded to talk with people like that. And, and hopefully we can hire some to Nikhil's point where we're hiring everywhere. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I appreciate the time uh, from both of you. It was really a pleasure to, uh, to speak with you. I will, um, for anybody watching this right now, I'll post uh, links below to CoVenture uh, as well as information about uh applying for opportunities there as well so i'll have that in the youtube and podcast description so you have that available as well but appreciate the time guys thank you so much thank, thank you, you.